Hi folks, welcome to another episode of the Bonsai Stuff Podcast. As always, me, Scott Martin, Bonsai Matsu, thank you very much for listening in. I do truly appreciate it. Hope everyone had a lovely Easter. Easter is well and truly gone now. The uh, weather where I'm based in, in Melbourne is certainly feeling like it's turning. We've had you know nice warm sunny days, which is lovely, and then really cool nights. So it, it's getting that feeling where it's not um, not necessarily frost on the way, but it's definitely that cooler, more damp when you wake up in the morning and walk around, there's a bit of dew on the grass and that sort of stuff. So it's turning, it's changing. So I wanted to talk in, in this podcast about a couple of things. I'm going to get on to deciduous pruning, which is a, it's a really good time for that right now. But I'm going to talk about wound management in your bonsai and about a term called compartmentalization, which is what the trees do when they lock away uh, it, from damage or from fungal issues and that sort of stuff. So I want to talk a little bit about that too because I find that really interesting, especially how it relates to us with bonsai and how, well, I believe we should be looking after the wounds when we cut off a major branch or the trunk's removed or there's a big scar there somehow that, that we need to take care of and we need to do our best to help the tree as much as we possibly can. You know, trees in pots, limited resources, the more we can do to help, the, the better we are, the stronger the tree is going to be, the less we have to worry about things further down the track. So that's going to be the um, the major point for this um, this podcast. So settle in, grab yourself a uh, nice cool beverage or something warm to sip on. If you're driving, please keep your hands on the wheel and let's get into it. Okay, so there's a term, CODIT, C-O-D-I-T. Stands for Compartmentalization of Decay in Trees. So what that basically means is these trees that we love are so damn smart that they will lock away uh, infected areas or parts of parts of the tree that are decaying or have fungal issues and prevent it from spreading through the rest of the tree. So, so CODIT, right? So it's Compartmentalization of Decay in Trees. And where that um, where that gets really cool is they create these these barriers inside the tree, and those barriers create like a like a last line of defence, if you like, for the for the tree. So it stops decay or you know fungal issues from spreading into the the, the vascular system of the tree. So it provides a safety measure for for the trees. And it you know it, I read somewhere that it was in in preparing for the for the podcast that someone talked about it. Like a, um, if you think of a tree like a like a sinking ship, and there's a hole in the side of the the boat, then what the tree will do for the greater greater good, like with a boat if it's sinking, what they can do the large boats is lock off certain sections of the inside of the hull to stop that water from coming in and spreading further and sinking the ship and therefore losing the entire boat. So what the tree will do is it locks away a certain area and basically concedes defeat in that area and says, yep, no worries, you're in there, that's fine, you can have that part, but no further. You're not going to go further. So it prevents the – it does – it provides something to the rest of the tree to prevent the rest of it being damaged at the expense of that particular area on the tree that's got the the decay or the, the rot or the, the fungal issue that's, that's happening in it. So it, it basically separates the infected material from – the rest of the tree and stops or mitigates the spread of the issue through the rest of the tree. So sacrifice something for the greater good of the rest of the tree, which, you know, it's pretty cool. I love it. I remember when I, I did some study, agricultural, agricultural study, and I read all about this a long time ago, it was like, that was really cool. Like it's not something that I'd heard talked about when it came to, to bonsai. And it was just one of those things that sort of blew me away about how cool these little trees are from the point of view that, you know, they'll they'll look after the greater good at the expense of whatever it is. And it flicks a switch in my, my head for me to say that we need to be, be pretty careful about uh, how we look after our trees and, and where we help them where we can because where they flick the switch to say, you know what, I'm not going to worry about that anymore, it might be our favourite branch on the tree. 
or it could be the apex or it could be, you know, a, a beautiful part of the trunk that's got lovely bark on it where they go, you know what, I'm going to compartmentalise that section of the trunk because there's a, a wound above it. So therefore that's all going to die, which means that lovely bark that we like looking at is going to disappear. Or you might find that, you know, part of the trunk years down the track, the bark starts to lift off it and it's just all dead underneath because the tree's locked away that area saying, well, you know what, there's an issue with this part of the tree. So therefore... I'm throwing my hands in the air, saying, you know, for the greater good of this, of, of the rest of us, for the for the tree, I can't, I can't manage to keep that and and look after it as well. And if you've ever seen a tree that's been cut in half or cut down, and you know, suddenly there's a massive amount of decay inside, like the the, the core might be rotted, or you, you'll be cutting, you know, wood for timber and. Um, for, for, for burning or whatever it is, firewood, and you, you sort of cut the rings and you're fine, 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 and all of a sudden you get to one and go, well, look at that. There's a massive dead part or rotten part inside the core of this tree, which at some point or another, the tree, you can see the lines, that the, the barriers that the tree has put up to protect the rest of the tree. It's, it's allowed uh, that situation to be controlled and managed and then the trees continue to grow and may have merged around that or they might end up being a big hollow in, in part of the trunk that you can see from a, from a distance. That's, that's that compartmentalisation, you know, the, the locking away of the decay in the tree for the greater good of the rest of it. And it just, it, it, to me, it really puts a spotlight onto the need for us to be very careful when and, and mindful when we remove branches or we take major cuts on trunks to change angles or reduce height or increase taper and all the stuff that we we talk about and we do with our bonsai automatically like you know yes i want to do this i want to bring the height down i want the tree's direction to change so therefore if i cut that part off that's what i'll get and anyone who's bought more mature ground grown stock from a nursery that you know maybe has come out of the ground 12 months ago or something like that and you get it home and over the years you suddenly look where the big trunk chop was made and the bark starts dying around that area. And it often comes from from this withdrawal of sap from those areas and where there's been an incident, let's just call it an incident, right? So it can be major branch removal, it can be trunk chopping, it can be fungal issues, it can be anything. The tree's compartmentalising that area saying something's gone wrong, you're not going to affect the rest of the tree, we're going to go on surviving so therefore I'm going to lock it away and whatever happens with that part of the tree, it's not concerned anymore. It just moves on with, with life, you know, and in, 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 in continuity and says, you know what, let's just keep going forward, let's not look backwards. And that's where I'm really mindful how I manage wounds, especially the larger stuff. Like and I'm talking anything, if you get your little finger, anything bigger than your little finger, I'd strongly recommend, from my experience, using a cut paste or a cut putty on it. Smaller than that, it's sort of 50-50. When you get the fine, light little branches that you're pruning off, yeah, I wouldn't wouldn't worry about it. But once it starts getting more significant, and if you're cutting something, you know, the size of your size of your forearm off, off a tree, then I think we need to be really careful about how we do it. And it might be – there's different strategies for it. It might be that you – you leave a stub, you know, you maybe cut, you know, a centimetre past it or half an inch past, depending on where you are, past the the point where you want the final cut to be, allowing that dieback to occur, that withdrawal of sap, and then cleaning that wound off and then, and then starting to transition it over a period of 6, 12 months, whatever it is. Or if you remove it and it's a nice flush cut, using, using cut paste or cut putty over that wound, it can't hurt. You know, it's it's. I think of it always like that cut paste. I know some people are against using it or or don't see the benefit of using it because a tree is going to do whatever the tree does anyway. Yeah, and that's true to a certain extent, but it acts like a like a band aid, where it provides that waterproof membrane to stop the wood getting in and rotting. Because you know, let's say you've got got something that's that's decent size. You know, maybe it's a cut that's a couple of centimeters across. You cut that. And you want the cambium, the new bark, to roll over and heal across that wound. If you don't put protective sealant on it of some kind of water repellent, whatever it is, there's all different things I've seen where, you know, foil gets put over the wounds and whatever, or different types of materials. I generally stick with the bonsai wound sealant of one kind or another. I don't, I don't think there's much of a difference between them all. 
maybe there is, I don't mean disrespect by it, but from what I've found, they all pretty much do the same sort of thing. I use a, the, the glue one, the tube of glue for my deciduous and I use the putty one for my conifers and, and pines just because of the, the sap on the on the pines and the conifers is a bit too thick and heavy so it doesn't allow the, the glue to settle and dry before it pushes it away. So I find the putty is far more effective. Anyway, uh, so if you've got something that's, you know, maybe a couple of centimetres across and you don't put wound sealant on it and that wound, the I'm talking about the heartwood, the, the wood that's behind the cut, not where the new cambium is going to grow from around the edge, around the periphery of the cut, but that core of where you've made the cut that can rot and if, you know, you're talking about something that's a couple of centimetres across, for that wound to heal, depending on the age of the tree, you might find that that's five years. It could be longer. It could be quicker based on, you know, younger trees heal faster. Older trees take a little bit longer, a lot longer, and the really old trees take a really, really long time to, to do it. So by not protecting that that inner core of the heartwood, you're going to find that's going to start to rot. So by the time that cambium starts to roll over, that wood that it's rolling over is getting very soft and porous. And as it sort of starts to decay more and more, compartmentalization kicks in, the tree goes, you know what, that's it, I'm blocking this off. So rot away, do what you're going to do. So it'll heal over and start to roll in and you'll end up with a, a hollow in the tree. Might be a lovely design feature. I'm not saying it's every every cut that you make has to be absolutely perfect on the trunk but if your if your notion is to heal that wound over because you don't want rot, rot going in or you don't want a hollow in the tree depending on what sort of species it is it may not suit the design by putting you know say a cut cut paste over it i find that 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 waterproof membrane kicks in the water hits it runs away you know it allows for prevention of any kind of bugs or slugs or snails coming in or or rot happening in that wood you know fungal issues getting into it it's got that that membrane over it and it allows for the cambium to start rolling over nicely and the next part of the 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 conversation on the podcast is about what do we do when the cambium stops because the tree is only going to allocate a certain amount of energy and resources to this healing because of this this compartmentalization is coded that we talked about at the start, the compartmentalization of decaying trees. Once it gets to a point and says, you know what, that's enough. I've locked away the wood underneath already. No more resources. The cambium stops growing. You've still got a, a lot of heartwood in there that you can see that you know is going to rot away at one stage or another. You might not want it to based on the design. So I find that now, like in autumn and spring, it's it's a great time as they're as they're growing times for the trees, just to irritate the edge, the inside inside edge of the cambium, the new cambium that's grown over with something sharp. I use a little gin knife that I've got that I, I get from Japan. They're fantastic, but it could be anything. It could be um, the tip of your scissors where you sort of scratch it around the edge of the cut, or a piece of you know bonsai wire, maybe four or five mil bonsai wire that's got a bit of rigidity and you cut it on a nice sharp angle and it creates like a little blade, whatever it is, I find that just going around the edge of those wounds at this time of the year and irritating them to the point that the tree goes, you know what, there's something attacking the the work that I've done. I need to put more resources to it. So then the cambium continues to grow inwards. I found that when I just leave it to its own devices, it may or may not heal over properly and it may or may not take you know forever for it to happen i found that by irritating during the autumn period and spring period so twice a year just getting to give a little scratch you know you don't want to do it so much that you're actually removing all the new new bark that's grown there you just want to scratch the edge so you see the light green fresh new growth underneath and then put some more cut paste or cut putty over the top of it and walk away leave it a go don't don't do any more to it and it, I find that I get another kick of growth in that area where it says, okay, I've got to do something about it now. So it pushes more resources to it, starts to heal over. Then it gets through, you know, whatever the next season is, be it you know summer for the Northern Hemisphere or winter for the Southern. And then spring comes around, tree starts growing again. It's got all this, you know, stuff flying through the tree. It's got resources to, to burn irritate that that cambium as well around that little bit of the wound just lightly and the tree pushes resources to it 
at the expense of another part of growing in the tree and that wound starts to heal over again. So I find that this talk about compartmentalization, while it, you know, often when you read about it, it's it's about bigger trees they're talking about, massive trees and you know, some of the archaic ways it used to be dealt with was you know pouring concrete into the trunks of trees to give them something hard to to grow over. Um, I'd love to be the guy who chainsaws down that tree with a block of concrete stuck in the middle of it. But anyway, we don't we don't do that stuff with bonsai, and we we incorporate decay into our design. But there's certain times, especially when you've freshly made the cut, that it may not be appropriate for that to happen. Certainly, there's species that that don't heal over quite so well, like I say, junip- most junipers. I say most. I think almost every one of them, but most don't, which is why leaving the dead wood on there, the gins and and whatever else, is really really nice because that's naturally what we sort of see on the older trees. It's a nice design feature, but on you know other trees like maples, for instance, or most deciduous trees, seeing that dead wood, it's a short term thing because the wood doesn't last very long and it it rots really, really fast. So I find that if I'm making a major cut, unless I want to, you know, have a massive bit of dead wood on the on the trunk of the tree, which is also great and fine and I've done it and I really like it. But if that's not your intention, you need to take action because the the design <laughs> control pretty quickly gets taken out of your hands when the tree starts to rot and starts to pull resources away from that area and you've only got a limited amount of time to try and fix this stuff. So so yeah, decay decay in the trees is 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 a is a real thing. And like I said, I, I use my, my little finger as the as the catalyst and you know good good housekeeping, keeping the, the cleans cut, using wound sealant, getting into to wound management is is part of my process. I know that the trees have got limited resources and I want I want root growth, I want foliage growth, but I have to have wound repair as well. It's it's a major thing, this this compartmentalization in, in all trees. And just because they're in tiny little pots or they may not be, you know, four hundred meters tall, it's definitely something that has to be part of part of our focus with our with our care with these trees and we'll be right back. Baking from our childhoods just sticks in the memory, doesn't it? We never set off on holiday without piles of Tupperware. And there'd always be Bakewell slice, flapjacks and tray baked scones in the boot. Do you not do that, Lisa? No. (laughs) Sadly, I do not stack uh, the Tupperware in the back of the car when we go off on holiday. Welcome to Small Ways to Live Well, a new podcast from The Simple Things magazine. Season two is a pick-me-up tonic that helps us make the shift from winter to spring. A six-week suggestion box full of things to note, notice and enjoy about the season. Search for Small Ways to Live Well on your podcast app. To be honest with you, where this talk about compartmentalization came from because I, I love that word I love saying it it's just, it sounds great you know compartmentalization you can use it in you know so many different facets of your life from here on out but I um where where I look back at my notes for for this episode of the podcast where compartmentalization came into it was I want to talk about us as bonsai enthusiasts as, as these bonsai lovers and it stemmed from a mistake or an omission or an error that came along. And I, I'm, I'm in a position where I hear a lot about these things because often people reach out when, when things go wrong. You know, trees didn't get watered when they went away. What should I do? Or the trees change colour or I've got, you know, these bugs on it, whatever it is. And, and so for me, my thinking was uh, we need to, as, as tree lovers, as bonsai lovers, be able to compartmentalise when things go wrong, when it doesn't work well for us. And that was my first note was we need to learn about compartmentalization with our bonsai so we can continue moving forward. It's We don't get to a point and go, my favorite tree has died, that's it, I'm done. I, I think there's I think there's so much more to it than, than one individual bonsai. I think that what we get out of this, you know, mentally and, and physically and emotionally out of out of being around trees is so much more than that. And we need to practice the process of compartmentalization, learning, learning from the issue, learning from the process that I've talked about before, but, but taking, taking your stride, drawing a deep breath 
and being able to lock it away and go, you know what, that's okay. Whatever it is, I'm going to move forward because I've said it before, you know, a branch falls on a tree and smashes the pot and tears off the key branch. I guarantee you three or four years down the track when that tree is redeveloped, you'll be looking for where that branch came from. And that that is hand on heart, honest truth that I have it with me where I, I do things or things happen with a tree or a branch dies and it's like, oh, that's it, it's done. Design over, game over, we're done. Then I look back somewhere down the track and go, oh, that's right, that that had that branch that died in, oh, where was it again? Oh, that's, there it is there and the wounds healed over, the rest of the trees continued to develop. I still love it, I still enjoy the time with it. Yeah, it's not what it was but it doesn't matter to me anymore. It's not what... I don't love it because of what it was. I love it because of what it is and what I, what we both get out of our interaction. You know, the tree lives forever and thrives and is in, in such a good condition that it possibly may never have got that good if it was growing in the ground. And, you know, it's got to say thank you to me for saying, you know what, I'm going to live for a thousand years now thanks to you, mate. Good good work. And and I get a lot out of it too and I, you know, the, the, the item is reciprocated. So... That's where this section of the podcast came from. We've got to lock it away. And I, by doing that, I went, well, I've now got to talk about compartmentalization. And when I started digging, it's like, oh, well, let's talk about decay because that's <laughs> it's actually a really interesting topic. Decay and bonsai and wound management is uh, some of the key things that we have to do with our, with our bonsai. So lock it away. No point dwelling on what was, only what is. Keep moving forward. Change your plan. Update it. Rewrite it. Restructure everything. And just keep keep going forward. I've said it before and I'll say it again. I really do love the subscribers to this podcast. It means a lot to the continuity of it and um, it means a lot to me to know that I've got the support of a, of a range of people out there that um, that really believe in in what this podcast is about. So, thank you very much. And if you aren't a subscriber but you're thinking about it, you can you can jump on board for as little as three dollars a month. And it, like I said, it really does go a long way to supporting the continuity of this this podcast for everybody. So, please consider. And if you'd like to, and if you've got the means to, then then jump on board and become a, a bonsai lover like the rest of us. Who would have thought talking about decay would be uh, something for this podcast? <laughs> anyway, it, there's a lot more to it. I've, I've breezed over it. I've, 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 I've basically simplified and cut down, you know, lots and lots of work. And and there's so much more to it. If you are interested in in finding out about decay, I'd, I'd strongly recommend that you you have a read about it. It is it is an interesting topic. But I want to move on now to talk about deciduous pruning, where we are now, sort of getting into. You know, we're, we're a month deep into autumn now, so we're getting to the heart of things and it's a really good time for a, um, for a deciduous pruning to give your, um, give your trees a, a nice cut now prior to dormancy. There, there's ideal times for it when it comes to, to pruning and it's just prior to leaf drop. That's not always possible and it depends on the volume of trees that you've got. It's like um, like black pine work for me. The ideal time for it is, is coming up but if I run short of time, then what's the point? If I miss the boat, then it's too late. So what I do, what my approach with it is with my deciduous pruning is I can get into it now and work more with trees that are less developed and get up so that my, my better trees – are the ones that get done in the perfect timing. So, yeah, I know it's not exactly the right time. We still need to wait a little, if you can, if you only got one or two, maybe wait just a little bit longer. Just prior to leaf fall is when you want to be doing the um, the, the deciduous pruning. But like I said, you can't, uh, you can't always have the luxury of time depending on where you're at. So I like now forward being my real go time because you find that when you start making your cuts now on your deciduous, you're far less likely to get a second flush of growth. If you'd done it, you know, a month or so ago, then you're more likely to get a, a flush of growth where the buds will activate because it's still in the growing period. Whereas now it's flicked the switch, starting to pull resources back in. You look around street trees at the moment, and where I am, they're they're starting to change colour. 
so it, the the resources are starting to get pulled in from the from the leaves from the foliage of the of the trees as they get ready to go towards the winter dormancy. So pruning now is is a is a good time for me. It's the signal to say, you know what, get out there and, and start with the less developed stuff. And you know, I, I don't like to work in absolutes, saying guaranteed you won't get a second flush of growth. But like I said, it. I'm pretty confident now that for me, my garden, my trees, my environment, that I've you know I'm I'm pretty good to start making that 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 autumn prune now, and know the trees will still heal the wounds that I make, and be ready to go for for the winter winter dormancy. If I leave it too long, and this is my worst case scenario, if I don't get my trees done in time and they do go dormant and I start cutting them, then they just start to bleed. The the sap just flows through them and if the tree can't heal the wounds that I've made, then I've found that that sap can just keep flooding out through the whole of winter. I've had it where I've had branches break on, on Japanese maples and it just bleeds for months. Like it just does not stop until the tree gets active again. Once you know spring kicks around or the growing starts, then that wound starts to heal over. So I'm, I am overly cautious with my autumn pruning to do it sooner rather than later. So if I get to the point with you know however many trees I've got to get through and, and prune, and I feel like I'm starting to push it a little bit, like I'm going to start running short of time, and I'm into that sweet spot of my pruning. I'll, I'll flick the switch and I'll get to my better trees and I'll do them right when they should be done. And that, that varies for the trees too. Like it's it's not something that a calendar date will tell me or a time of the year. It's more you look at each of the trees and say, yeah, I had that one's ready to, to go. Like its leaves have changed colour. It's nice and bright coloured and they're not, you know, not hanging around for very much longer. So I need to get in there and pop the leaves off and give it a bit of a prune and, and she's good to go. Whereas other ones you look at and go, no, nah, they're still holding onto those leaves pretty firmly, so that, that's got a little bit more time to it. So I will certainly shuffle in the better trees to be done at the right time, but the other stock, you know, some of my growing stock that I'm developing that's, you know, maybe got lots of sacrifice branches, whatever it is, I'm maybe not quite as uh, committed to, to getting them done necessarily so I can push them to the back of the queue. If I've got time, great. If I don't, I'd rather leave them and then get into the, the spring prune once the tree starts to, to, to come out of dormancy the other side of winter and do it then rather than cutting them late this year into dormancy and having them just bleed sap and lose resources. I, don't, I definitely don't want to do that. So I'd rather miss the season for, for trees and development than do it and have the tree simply just bleed out. As we were talking about with compartmentalisation, I know that if I've got a tree that's that's got an open open cut, that's just pouring out sap, that's not healing, that's not able to compartmentalise, then I've got far greater risk of something getting into the tree, a fungal issue happening, getting into that wound, that exposed part of the tree. And I know that I can't use my cut post or cut putty because the sap's just going to push it away. So therefore I've got a tree that you know, is in a real... Real state, so like I said, I'd I'd rather do things a bit on the earlier side, than than get them too much on the on the late side. And I do like it when I can remove the leaves on the tree, have a look at the structure of the tree, and that's when for me deciduous all the hard work that we've done, everything you do with pinching or your pruning processes or feeding to get back budding or reducing branch length, whatever it is that we do, work on taper of branches and trunk. This is when we get to see it on the deciduous because we see the silhouette, the winter silhouette, and it's amazing. So that's when I like to get in there. As I can remove the, the, the leaves, just as they're getting right to the end of their usefulness, the tree's taken as much as they possibly can to store it away, but it's still got a little little left in the tank to heal the wounds that I'm about to make. Get in there, cut cut back the, the structure of the tree, have a look at it, and take photos. This is the time when you get that reward or you can review the plan. You know, once you see that silhouette of the tree, it might be that you you look at it, you prune it, you take a photo, sit back, put it aside and say, you're done. Look at the photo over and over, look at the tree and visualise and see if there's anything that's still wrong with the tree. Maybe it's major structural. There's a too thick a branch near the apex. Maybe it's crossing branches. Maybe the flow just isn't there for the, for the design of the tree. If you haven't got it pruned in time for, for dormancy, that's cool. Just leave it for spring. 
But keeping that photo and keeping that reference point now is, is so worthwhile because year on year, look at the winter silhouette of your deciduous trees and see, one, <laughs> how bloody slowly they grow and develop. But secondly, where your hard work goes, like everything that you're putting into the trees for that winter silhouette when it comes to deciduous trees. And with that too, like I like to look at my sacrifice branches at the moment. That's definitely something that I've been going through the collection and reducing a lot of the sacrifice branches on on a lot of the trees, especially the deciduous that have grown out. Some that have been removed have been growing for, you know, three, four, five years and they've got quite long. And one of the things that I use as a telltale for removal or shortening, you know, uh, sacrifice branch reduction is the rest of the tree that's left over because how does that look if if the main tree is starting to look like it's weakening if the shoots are quite small maybe there's a little bit of dieback on a few branches as well a few areas of the tree possibly haven't done as well as what they should then it's time to think about removing or reducing those sacrifice branches and when you look at the sacrifice branches just think about one is the job done what did what was the sacrifice branch for there in the first place? You know, was it trunk thickening? Was it branch thickening? Improving taper? What what was it there for? If if it's done its job, if it's if you're happy, then you can look at removal and think about the compartmentalization, the decay in the tree. So if it's major, and most sacrifice branches are pretty thick, they're going to be thicker than your little finger anyway. Think about leaving a stub for for dieback and then cleaning it up over time. Think about wound management that we talked about a little bit earlier, all that all that stuff. If, secondly, you look at the sacrifice branch and think, yes, there's, there's a reduction in strength of the main tree that's significant that I need to take into account because I'm going to start losing the majority of the tree because a tree's starting to push resources way too much into the sacrifice branch, then... But you know, but you you haven't got the job done. Like you're thinking, no, that trunk needs to be thicker, or no, that branch needs to be thicker. Look along the sacrifice branch, and is there a bud that you can cut back to? Normally, for me, I use a general rule of thumb that if I can cut it back to about a third the size that it currently is, so if it's sort of you know, let's say the sacrifice branch is a meter long, then I'd look to reduce the sacrifice branch back to about 30 centimetres or thereabouts, give or take. Not, it doesn't need to be exact, but wherever I've got a strong bud or an area that's growing in that or a little side branch that's coming off the sacrifice branch in that area, then I'll cut about, you know, maybe two or three centimetres past that point on the sacrifice branch to make sure that I get enough sap flow to that branch so then the, the sacrifice branch can then continue. So what happens, it's like a, a seesaw effect. So where the seesaw had gone up one side, where all the resources had gone into the sacrifice branch, by coming in and cutting it back, then the resources push back. The seesaw goes the other way and it pushes back into the tree. And then what will happen is as that sacrifice branch then starts growing again and starts taking resources and starts getting longer and closer to the sun and getting you know achieving more of the tree's primary objective to get sunlight and get taller – then the seesaw will swing down again. And at that point, I'll look to make another cut back somewhere. So sacrifice branches can almost be never-ending. But your management management of the sacrifice branch is every single season that you look at it. You need to make the assessment where you look at it and go, is it getting too much? Has it done its job? Yes. Is it is it is the main tree okay? Is it developing as it should be, or you know, is the third option is you know, everything's going to the sacrifice branch? I need to then make an adjustment to it. And sacrifice branches aren't always about thickening. They're not always about you know making something meatier. I use them on trees that possibly get a little bit weaker. So as the tree matures a little bit and starts to become more and more refined. Sometimes you can find there's a bit of lack of vigor because you're constantly pinching and pruning and holding things back and making sure things don't thicken. And I like to, on, on those trees from occasion, pick maybe three or, three or four spots around the whole tree and go, I'm just going to let you run. I'm going to let you have a good season this spring and I'm not going to cut you off until autumn. So while they don't get necessarily massive, you know, they might only get to be 30 or 40 centimetres long, something like that. But I know that it's sort of increased the vigour of the tree and the tree then I find all over suddenly gets like a lift and then I come in at autumn time about now, 
reduce all those those branches back. And if I find that the tree still is lacking a little bit of vigour, then next spring I'll let three or four of them run around the tree in different spots as well. So I don't destroy my silhouette. I don't destroy my, my twiggy ramification. I don't destroy anything about the tree. All I do is I look to push the vigour up by allowing these sacrifice branches to run. So now is a really good time to do that autumn pruning but also to review your sacrifice branch program and the plan that you've got it on because autumn's a healing time autumn's a time where we the tree's strength increases it's a time when we we up the fertilizer because that makes the trees far better going into next spring and summer that are going to be just around the around the corner so when the foliage is is green it hasn't taken up the nutrients from the leaves and pruning at that point can be not as beneficial as once the leaves have changed when the tree's taken what it needs. You might find that you get a little bit of another growth spurt at that point, but you might not. My, my point is that if you're going to be getting into doing the autumn pruning, err on the side of caution. If you've got a bucket load of trees you've got to do, start sooner rather than later. Being too late is far worse, in my opinion, than starting, starting the prune too early. And that, my friends, brings us to the end of the podcast. Thanks for sticking around. Hope you've enjoyed it. Hope you uh, enjoyed listening to me talk about tree decay <laughs> and autumn pruning. But they are really important, and the two go hand in hand now. Like I said, autumn's a really – it's a beautiful time for our trees. Man, I love the I love the look of the deciduous. I really do. I, I love where the pines get to at this time of the year as well after, you know, if they've been decanted or even if they haven't, if they're a single flush or whatever, they're, everything just looks beautiful about them. And I know that I'm a, my fingers are itchy trying to get in there and actually get my pines all worked. It's it's almost time to, to get in and pluck the needles and make them look magnificent again because they might be a bit woolly around the edges. But anyway... It is a great time. It's a really nice time to spend with your trees. You're going to have difficulty now. I'll just let you know. You're going to have difficulty with watering your trees at this time of the year. It's always tough. This change of season, you know, being hot, cold, wet, dry, windy, stagnant, it's it's always a difficult time to try and get it right. You're still prone to getting leaf burn. We, you know, we've got uh, day the other day was you know 29, and then thunderstorms in the afternoon. I know we're in Melbourne, but it's it's true. You know, things change pretty rapidly and pretty quickly. Just watch it. The tree is still going to be using a lot of water, a lot of water uptake. So I, as, as with most things, err on the side of caution and try and overwater rather than underwater. But it is a um, it is a it is a tricky one to get right. But keep that food pumping out as we head into the the second month for for autumn. You know, you should be on to the if you're using the tea bags, should be well and truly on to a second dose of fertilizer. And check your pines too. Maybe it's time to start feeding a few of those. A few may be coming the other side now of of the uh, decanning the black pines I'm talking about, where their needles have started to set and change colour and they're ready for for fertilizing. Be nice if you can because they need a good good boost of it um, before it gets into to dormancy to build their strength up, and especially things like white pines. Now's um now's not a bad time to to get into fertilising those to build their strength as as well because their fertilising's held back a little bit in in spring. Anyway, so thank you for sticking around. Thanks for listening. Thank you to subscribers. You are just bloody lovely. I love you all. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to the next episode of the, the Bonsai Stuff podcast. Got um, got a little bit about uh, protection techniques on major bends for the next one, which will be interesting considering that um, of uh, by the time it comes out, I'll have been at the uh, the Bonsai Open up at the Central Coast, which I, I can't wait to talk about on the podcast and let you know the, um, the feedback from that. And that should be one of the best shows, I think, uh, around Australia. So we'll see. We'll see and I'll, I'll let you know what, um, what happens. Until then, spend time with your trees. As always, give them a hug, give them a cuddle. Make sure you fertilise them. Give them lots of food. They need it right now. And until next time, happy bonsai. Bye.